Hello, Jeff Zwerink. Welcome back to Science Faith Connection, the segment of our show where we explore important scientific and philosophical ideas and see how they relate to the truth of Christianity. Today, I'm joined by a friend and a colleague, Dr. Ken Keithley, and we are going to investigate whether the Bible is a credible source. Ken, good to have you here today. Always enjoy talking with you. Good to be here. Thank you for having me. So there's a, a, just a kind of a big question out there. Is the Bible something worth listening to? Is it credible? And I know in my history in evangelism and talking with people, the idea of the Bible being something worth listening to has changed a lot over the last 30 years. Mm -hmm. So one of the ways that people weigh in on that is whether it has scientific credibility. So why, why do we even care about whether what science has to say about things if the Bible is self-authenticating, as we, we like to talk about? Yeah, that's a great question. And specifically as it relates to science, I mean, we can talk about the Bible and morality, the Bible and history, but you're asking about the Bible and science. And I think that we can make a very good case that the Bible, what it says about itself and what it says about the world in which we live, uh, fits very well with the findings of modern science. For example, the Bible says that there was a time when the world was not, that it was created. It was created creatio ex nihilo, out of nothing. Well, that fits very well with, say, like the Big Bang hypothesis. Now, one does not prove the other, but it shows that they fit together, as I said. There, there's a congruence there that I think is quite remarkable. Or again, uh, the Bible says that God created the world very good and that he created it uh, very, uh, giving great attention to preparing a place in which uh, humans, his image bearers, can live. And what do you know, uh, one, of the, one of the more intriguing findings of the 20th century was what we call uh, the fine-tuning of the universe, uh, and that uh, this universe is um, constructed in such a way that it, it allows for humans to live here and to thrive. And of course, reasons to believe, uh, Hugh and others have, have, have written about this extensively, and they're writing some, about something that really does fit well with what the Bible has to say about creation, uh, that uh, you, know, you have all of the creation, uh, the, the, the steps of creation in Genesis 1, to bring up to the apex in which humans are able to live here in this world. But it may be uh, fine-tuned, but it didn't have to be this way. It's contingent. Uh, and one of the things that I have found uh, interesting in my conversations with you is the discussion about the multiverse and about how, I mean, the, this universe could have been very different. And in fact, maybe there even are universes that are different. Uh, so there is a certain contingency to the universe. Uh, it's orderly. Uh, there, there is a regularity and orderliness to the universe that we are able to discern. Uh, and uh, scientists calls this um, these things the laws of nature. Well, the Bible would call that God's providence, his faithfulness. And so uh, the Bible makes much about the regularity and orderliness and, and this this uh, regularity that the universe has, uh, you and I are able to understand it to a certain extent. And this is an amazing thing. I mean, think about it. There could have been a universe created in which we were able, we're not able to, to, to comprehend it at all. And yet I think this is, speaks to the fact that um, a good God who is a lawgiver uh, created this world, and then he created us to be reflectors of him in his image. So therefore, we have a finite capacity to think his thoughts after him. And so there is a, uh, an understandableness to the universe. And at the very same time, it's surprising. Um, you know, there, we can't just simply uh, think that God is this grand intellect and then just try to use philosophy and logic uh, to understand the world. That's what the Platonists did. What the scientific revolution is all about was the understanding, the Christian understanding, that God is not only intellect, in intellect but he's also will. He has a will. And so 
um, we're not going to be able to simply logically deduce how the world is. We're going to have to go out and look at it, which um, gave rise to the whole empirical method. Uh, and so what we find is, is that God is able to surprise us. So therefore, there are all these kinds of um, random things. There are these emergent properties. There, there are things that scientists discover that we think, huh, I didn't see that coming. That wasn't on my bingo card. But that's the kind of God that we serve. And so, yes, I think that the, the biblical presentation of God and the world that he created really does present a robust framework for scientists to do their work. And it is a framework that is remarkably congruent with what scientists discover the world and how it is. You know, I, I've always found that a fascinating thing that when you look at Christianity, the Bible describes how the world works, we can measure how the world works. And if God's revealed himself in scripture, God's revealed himself in creation, we would expect those to be the same thing. And you've articulated that very well and, and, and some of those points. I'm kind of curious, how would you respond? Because there are people who would say, well, the Bible talks about, you know, okay, maybe there's a beginning, maybe there's an orderliness to things, but we've got axe heads floating, we've got a flood that destroys the world, mm -hmm. we've got all sorts of things, you know, the mustard seed being the smallest, and it really isn't. How do you deal with those things? If there's supposed to be this congruence, why are there these incongruences, if you will? Yeah, well, first thing about the axe head floating or things of that nature, what we're talking about are uh, immediate divine actions that we would other, otherwise uh, describe as miracles. The Bible itself makes it very clear that those are extraordinary things, that this is not God's ordinary way of operating. And so it isn't that we live in a world in which miracles happen on a daily basis. In fact, if that did happen, I mean, if we lived in, an, in a quasi-magical world, science couldn't happen because there wouldn't be a predictability to it. So even in um, the record of the Bible, the <laughs> miracles surprise them just as much as it would surprise us if a miracle we were to see a miracle today. What a miracle, what a miracle is, according uh, to scripture, is that it is intended to be a wondrous sign, something that points us to something very definite and particular. And if you notice, um, like I said, even, you know, the Bible is, 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 had, was written over a period of uh, over a 1400 years, maybe 1500 years. It covers a period of time uh, that are many thousands of years. And so the, the, the times of, of immediate divine action, you know, those are rare and surprising in biblical times too. So I'm not too alarmed that we live in an open universe in which the God of the universe, if he intends to show us signs, which incidentally, uh, since I am premillennial, I kind of, I, I expect that at the end of the age, there will be more more miraculous signs. Um, I'm not a materialist. We are not naturalist in the sense that we think that it is a closed system in which it does not allow uh, for the God of the Bible to do what he wants to do. And since he created it, uh, he can allow it to operate for millennia if he wants to, in which it just operates by God's ordinary providence. But those times in which he intends to reveal himself in a particular way, and of course, you and I as Christians believe that the ultimate miracle was Jesus Christ. When the, when the Son of God became flesh, lived the life that we cannot live, died on the cross, but then rose again from on the third day. I mean, I'm going to admit, that's a miracle. Dead people don't come back to life, typically. But we do affirm that God can do this if he, if he so chooses, and that he, the good news is he did choose to do this on our behalf. Well, thanks, Ken. I really appreciate your comments. You know, when we look at creation, we look at science and the Bible and whether the Bible is credible, we do find this remarkable congruence between what the science measures and what scripture has said for millennia before we even had the chance to weigh in on that. And yet in the midst of that, we also see that there is this God who's in control of it all, who can step in and do things 
that marvel and awe and wow us. And, uh, you know, we just find that fascination in scripture. You know, I would encourage you, if you found this interesting, want to investigate this more, go to reasons.org, search for Ken Keithley's page. It's K-E-A-T-H-L-E-Y. A lot of resources there talking about this and many other things that help you become more convinced of the truth of scripture so that you can go out and tell others about how much God loves them.